A Cask of Amontillado, from poemmuseum.org, by Edgar Allan Poe, published in 1847. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose. However, that gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was at a point, definitely, settled by the very definitiveness with which it was resolved, precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unrest when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued as was my in to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my to smile now that was at the thought of immolation. He had a weak point. This Fortunato Although in other regards, he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso of the spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity, to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from his, from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had drinking so, for he had been drinking much. The man wore a motley, he had a tight-fitting, party-stripped dress, and his head was surmounted, surmounted by conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing this hand, his hand. I said to him, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How? said he. Amontillado? A pipe? Impossible. But in the middle of the carnival, I have my doubts, I replied. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado. I have my doubts, Amontillado, and I must satisfy them, Amontillado, as you are a gauge, and I am on my way to Lefreshi. If any one has critical turn, it is he. He will tell me, the Cressy cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults? My friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. The Tressy, I have no engagement. Come, my friend, no. It is not the engagement, but a severe cold, which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lutrezzi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Monsiliado. The speaking Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, and putting a mask of black silk, drawing a ruquili closely about my person, I suffered him to him hurry to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until this morning and had given explicit orders not to steer from house. These orders were sufficient. 
I well knew to ensure their immediate disappearance, once and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their scones two from books, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suits, suites of rooms to the archway that led to the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came length to the foot of the descent, descent and stood together upon the damp of ground of catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, he said. It is farther on, said I, but I observe the white web work which gleams from these cavern walls. It turns towards me. It looks into my eyes with two flimly orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Nitre? he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <clears throat> my friend found it impossible to reply for so many minutes. It is nothing, he said. At last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich. Respected, admired, beloved, you are happy, as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill. I cannot be responsible. Besides, there's Lutresi. Enough, he said. The cough's a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of cough. True, true, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you necessarily. But you should use all the proper caution. A draught of this maddock will defend us from the damps. Here, I knock off the neck of the bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mould. Drink, I said, presenting him this wine. He raised it to its lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly. Well, as bells jingled, I drink, he said, to the berry that reposed around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Mont Resource, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forgot your arms. A huge human foot they are, and a field of azure. A foot crashes a serpent rampant, whose fangs are embedded in the heel. In the motto, Nemo me impun less sit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. He had passed through long walls of pallid skeletons with casks and puncheons intermingling into the almost recess of the catacombs. I paused again and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See, it increases, it hangs the moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle along the bones. Come, we will go back ere it's too late. Your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on, but first another draught of the medoc. I broke and reached him a flag out of the grave. He emptied it, he emptied it at the bread. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him at surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend? He said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masoons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A Mason? A Mason, I replied. A sign, he said. A sign. It is this, I answered, producing from the ben from beneath of my folds to declare a trowel. You jest, he explained, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath of the cloak and again offering him my arm. 
He leaned upon it heavily. It we continued our route in search of the Ontoliado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at the deep crypt, in which, in which the fullness of the air caused our flambeaux rather to glow in flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of his interior crypt were still ornamented in his manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point of mouth of same size, some size. Within the wall, thus exposed at the placing of the bones, we perceived a still interior crypt or recess in depth about four feet in width, three in height, six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely an interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof catacombs and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of the solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein it is the Amontillado. As for the Lutresi, he sent ignoramus, interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward, which I followed immediately at his heels. At heels. In Nietzsche, and finding in an instant, he had reached an extremity of Nietzsche, and finding his progress arrested by this rock, he stood stupidly and bewildered. A moment more, and Hyde fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other, about two feet horizontally, from one of these dependent short chain from the other. A padlock, throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astrounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling of the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you, but I must fire. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. Diamonciliado, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, Diamonciliado. As I said these words, I bested myself among the pile of bones, which I had spoken, throwing them aside. I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my towel, I began vigorously to wall upon the entrance of the Nietzsche. I had scarcely laid the first year of the masonry when I discovered the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with a more satisfaction. I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the towel. Finished without interruption, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh year. The wall was now nearly upon my level of my breast. I again paused, holding the flambeaux upon the mason work, drew a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams, bursting and suddenly from the throat of the chained form, seemed to trust me violently black back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled, unsheathing my rapier. 
I began to grope with it about the recess. But the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall and I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and strength. I did this. The clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth year. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. Struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the Nietzsche, a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty recognizing of that of a noble Fortunato. The voice said, Ha 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 ha, he he he. A very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many rich laugh about it in the plaza, eh? 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 Over our wine, eh? Hehe. <laughs> the I said. Hehehehe. <laughs> yes, the Amoncillado. But is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting at the palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said, let us be gone. For the love of God, Mundresor. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words I heartened in the vein of reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! No answer. I called again, Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick and it was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I hastened to make the end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up against the new masonry. I re-elected re the old rampant, rampart of the bones. For the half of a century, no mortal had disturbed them. In pace, break cat.